Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm rushing off to Richmond, the uh, Confederacy, the capital of the Confederacy this evening to go referee for two days at a regional <laughs> championship. So now that I'm retired, I referee a lot. So I bounce around the country. So um, I, uh, I also reenact. And uh, one of the things I did was actually Company B of the 29th U.S. Colored. So, um, and uh, this is a much younger me with the sword in front there with a, actually dark hair as opposed to the, the light hair. Um, we, uh, Company B was organized by um, uh, uh, the now appellate court judge, the Honorable Leroy Martin, who uh, needed a white officer to run the, because obviously uh, black, blacks were not permitted to be officers at that time. And so um, he asked me to be their white officer, understanding that my degree was in African history and that I understood a lot about African American history as well, um, and that uh, I wouldn't think it would be weird to you know, be with a black unit. So, uh, and we did some things for a number of years, um, which was interesting. I also reacted with the uh, Company F at a race scene of the second Wisconsin. So um, I've done a lot of uh, that kind of uh, stuff for the last 25 years. Anyway, it, it, it came to pass that um, we were in Naperville, when Naperville has an annual Civil War uh, day, so they did for many years. And um, we were camped there, and we used to do a program for Chicago school kids, and they would come for the weekend, and we would train the boys to be soldiers, and we would, uh, the girls would cook and do a variety of sort of contraband-style uh, you know, uh, tasks. And uh, we were, uh, uh, first, first Sergeant uh, Martin was out training the guys and one on Saturday morning, because they had obviously never handled muskets before and didn't know anything about uh, the basic evolutions. And I was sitting on a little stool by my little tent that I had. And um, uh, this lady comes in to the camp, and she asked me if I'm a Yankee or a Red, which is you know typical um, for a lot of people. Never mind I'm wearing my blue frock with captain's bars you know, on, on my shoulders. Um, so rather than actually answer her, I simply pointed six feet to my right where this beautiful US flag that says 29th USCT on it is flying. And um, she says, oh, and she says, what unit is this? And I said, well, you know, I told her what it was. And she says, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> and uh, she had literally no idea that there were black people in the Civil War, except maybe as slaves and servants. You know, black soldiers, really? You know, never mind there were 180,000 black soldiers fighting for the Union. Um, sadly, her ignorance was more the norm than, um, than, 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 than you know, she, despite the movie Glory, um, the American public is uh, remarkably ignorant of the role of people of color uh, in the uh, American Civil War. And this goes for reenactors as well, not just uh, folks that are, um, that are actually um, uh, just spectators. Anyway, um, so today I want to introduce you to um, a regiment, uh, the 29th USCI, which is the more correct name because it's colored infantry. USCT refers to troops of all arms, not just infantry. Um, and I'd like to give you a little bit about them and their white officers. Um, and they served with the 9th Corps under Burnside and then were later transferred into the 25th Corps, in, which was an uh, all-black uh, core that was created in, in, in 64 and then into 65. And they were involved with Grant's Overland Campaign and the Siege of Petersburg and Richmond. Now, the 29th was only six companies strong before its one major action, which was in the Battle of the Crater, July 30th, 1864. They had five from Illinois, A through E, and one credited to Wisconsin, which is the only uh, black company credited to the state of Wisconsin. Eventually, it would have its normal quota of 10 companies, but the other four companies wouldn't be raised until after July of 1864. Very few of the men who comprised companies G, H, I, or K, or the replacements that came in after the Battle of the Crater, um, well, actually came from Illinois. Uh, mostly they came from Virginia and the surrounding areas in that, that place. This was the only black regiment to be credited to Illinois. But like nearly all USCT regiments, it would carry a federal designation. There were a few exceptions, such as the famed 54th and the 55th Massachusetts. Um, the, the, there was a Massachusetts uh, cavalry unit also. Um, unlike white troops, 
save the regular army itself, the men of the USCT would be mustered directly into federal, not state service. So usually you were mustered into state service, you trained for a while, and then they would muster you into federal service. Uh, so until that actually happened, the, the 29th was called by the governor of Illinois, Governor Yates, the first Illinois colored infantry, even though the men weren't mustered ever by the state of Illinois. However, and here's where, it gets, where we get into this little interesting side thing. All USCT recruits could be credited to a state if their recruiting officers signed them up. So you would find people from, recruiters from, Illinois, from Wisconsin or Illinois would go to Mississippi in areas that had been liberated, and they would uh, sign up black slave, you know, uh, freedmen down there and then bring them back and they get credited to the draft quotas of, his, of Illinois or Wisconsin. And so that was, the big, that was the big thing that they were interested in doing. So this was one of the ways that the federal government tried to gain acceptance for the, for the raising of black troops um, by uh, the states. With the new draft law in effect in 1863, state governments could count every black soldier, irrespective of where they actually came from, that they recruited against their draft quota, thus lessening the number of white soldiers that they had to draft. These are some of the soldiers, pictures of some of the soldiers who were in the 29th. Um, the 29th was, a, was one of 149 African-American artillery batteries, infantry, and cavalry regiments to be raised by the Union. The history of most of these regiments is little known because most of the rank and file were illiterate. So we don't have the treasure trove of letters and diaries that fill out the stories of the white regiments. A very high proportion of black men who served were freedmen or contrabands who had not been allowed to learn to read or write while they were in bondage. That was, that was the law in the South. Since so many of them, in fact, were runaways, they often used false names to prevent their former masters from finding them, or, which makes it very difficult to pin down their personal histories. In addition, the non-commissioned officers were taken from the black enlisted men, and most of them could not read or write either. Nor were, they, nor were there very many contemporary regimentals written. So, you know, very often you had a veterans committee. For example, the 55th Illinois, which I've done a lot of research on and I reenacted for a while, had a group of four guys after the war that got together like 20 years later and decided to write, you know, a history, a veterans history. And then they, you know, they talked to the various people and they gathered letters and so forth. Well, this unfortunately happened very infrequently for uh, black regiments. There is uh, one famous history by um, uh, a Captain uh, Luis who's um, on the 54th Massachusetts, but he of course was a white officer who wrote it. Moreover, many of these regiments tend to be either shorthanded or have indifferent quality men when it came to officers, in spite of the establishment of application boards by the Army. True, there were some battle-tested veterans, such as Robert Gould Shaw of the 54th Massachusetts, who had been a captain in the 2nd Massachusetts, or John A. Bross of the 29th, who had been a captain in the 88th Illinois and had combat experience. They were very sincere in their efforts to make soldiers of African Americans, even if they weren't sure at first if they would make good fighting men. If you ever get a chance, you have the interest, uh, and you, the movie Glory is a wonderful movie, except that it is actually 95% on true in terms of the 54th Massachusetts. It, it did fight at Fort Wagner, yes, you know, but there weren't a lot of like, there were no illiterate people in the 54th. They were recruited from all over the country. They were usually, they were all freedmen. Um, two of Frederick Douglass' sons actually served it, including Sergeant Major, who was actually one of Frederick Douglass' sons. Um, but uh, that's an odd, but even there, Robert Gould Shaw, if you read his letters, Blue-Eyed Child of Fortune is the book, name of the book, he's like, I don't know if these guys, you know, I don't know, you know, what's going to happen when we actually find that out. And there's a one little key little moment in the movie when they're coming in on the boat to South Carolina, and the reporter from, I think it's Harper, says like, you know, we, you know a million people want to know what the 54th is going to do, and he looks at me and says like a million and one. <laughs> so um, that was kind of what he, because they didn't know if they would make good fighting men or not. Many others of those that were promoted into the ranks were good soldiers who were ambitious for a higher rank but did do a good job. But unfortunately, there were many unprincipled men, some even illiterate themselves, who just wanted a commission for the benefits that that status would confer. 
Many of these officers had been promoted from the ranks of white regiments and had no special training as to filling out the paperwork which we historians and genealogists are so fond of reading. Muster rolls, morning reports, even battle action reports. These things are fairly scarce for the USCI. For example, the captain of Company A of the 29th was named Robert Porter. He had exactly three months experience in the 10th Illinois, while Company B's commander, 24-year-old Hector B. Aiken, uh, H. Aiken rather, who I actually played, that was my character in uh, Company B when I reenacted, had been an enlisted man in the Chicago Board of Trade Battery. As a result, most of these regiments were deficient in getting paperwork done during the war. Part of this, too, was that officers were involved in the more important work of training and discipline and let the paperwork slide. Then there are post-war pension records, of which are normally very useful if they're telling the history of a, of a regiment. However, for the colored troops, these were, must be used with a lot of caution because they were collected by pension agents who wrote up the material for veterans who couldn't read or write. Often the language in these letters or these documents are identical in various supporting documents and we don't have other records to corroborate uh, the incidents cited in these various records. So it becomes difficult to find the information on these, these regiments. The 29th USCI was particularly shorthanded in officers due to having only six understrength companies when it was sent to the theater of war in Virginia. Now, by regulation, if you only had six companies, you could only have a lieutenant colonel. You weren't authorized to have a colonel. And that was major, that was Bross. Then there was a major, and then you could have company officers, but until you recruited up to at least 64 in the company, you, you couldn't have a captain and two lieutenants. So very often there was just one lieutenant running a company. When they went to Virginia, they were not yet authorized to have a colonel a chaplain, a surgeon, assistant surgeons, a quartermaster, or an adjutant, which meant they had to wait until they could have full, 10 full companies. So as you can imagine, the company officers were trying to double duty to trying to do those jobs as well for the, for the regiment. Uh, there is one interesting book that was compiled a few years ago, and I recommended Edward A. Miller's book, which is called The Black Civil War Soldiers of Illinois, and it's all about the 29th. Now, as you know, blacks were not allowed to enlist in the Union cause at the beginning of the war. But some, such as Major General Benjamin Butler and Major General David Hunter, pushed the Lincoln administration to begin to raise troops from newly freed slaves. In 1862, the Confiscation Acts of March 13th and July 17th provided the legal cover to use African Americans for any military purpose for which they were competent, which led to a few efforts to raise colored regiments. Then in 1863, after the Emancipation Proclamation, recruitment began to move forward with the government's blessing. The January 1st Emancipation Proclamation addressed this question directly. Quote, blacks will be received into the armed forces of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places. It did not say that blacks would be used in combat, but by making them garrison troops, some of them were likely to see the elephant, considering the porous nature of front lines in the American Civil War, especially in places like Tennessee, for example. Republican Governor Richard Yates was ahead of the curve. As early as July 1862, he was urging Lincoln to accept the services of all loyal men. In June of the next year, the Chicago Tribune, which was, of course, a very Republican paper, noted that 250 African Americans from Illinois had enlisted in Massachusetts regiments. With the prejudice against recruiting black men declining in the army and among civilians, the Tribune urged that Illinois would be better served by having the black inhabitants counting against Illinois state quotas instead of Massachusetts state quotas. The newspaper called upon Secretary of War Edwin N. Stanton to authorize Yates to raise a colored regiment, quote, that will stand as much hardship and fight as desperately and kill as many rebels in battle as any equal number of men of the purest Anglo-Saxon blood that have gone to the wars. Well, correspondence went back and forth between the governor and Stanton, and with the result, finally in September, for the authorization to raise one or two black regiments in Illinois. 
Well, Yates encountered immediately stiff opposition from copperheads in Illinois, of which, especially in southern Illinois, where there was very strong anti-black sentiment, which probably delayed his decision, but he finally called for raising the 1st Regiment Illinois Volunteers colored on October 26th. The first enlistments in what would become Company A of the 29th USCI came on November 1 in Quincy, Illinois. This is November 1 of 1863 now. Recruiting progressed very slowly for a number of reasons. First of all, the federal government had fixed the rate of pay for black soldiers at only $10, including $3 for clothing. So what that meant was is that you actually got $7, and $3 was taken out for any clothing or things that you needed. This is opposed to a white private who received $13 plus $3 for clothing, which is $16, and that's a, a really big difference. So why that difference? Well, they were afraid that whites would be upset if, they got, if blacks got paid the same, and so they went in and they paid them the rate for laborers, which was $10 a month. They also stipulated that no federal bounties could be applied to black enlistees. So naturally, this sort of discourages people a little bit from enlisting. Second. Illinois itself had a series of black codes which had passed when it became a state in 1818, which put all sorts of restrictions on blacks, such as there was a $1,000 that a free black was supposed to post as a guarantee if he arrived in the state to guarantee that he wouldn't become a public charge on the state of Illinois. $1,000, a lot of money. They could be flogged for being lazy or disobedient, and even arbitrarily expelled by the state by the overseers of the poor. They had no standing in courts, nor could they vote. They could even be sold into indentured service, read slavery, for failure to pay fines. In 1853, a law was passed prohibiting them from even entering the state of Illinois. And if they did so, they would be fined $50 and sold off to the highest bidder if they couldn't pay. Well, this sounds pretty much like Mississippi, if you want my opinion. All of these laws were still in effect in 1863, if not always, always enforced. And, uh, and here they are trying to recruit these people in 1863 and 1864. With all that institutional racism and demonstrated hostility uh, by whites, few Illinois blacks expressed good uh, expected good treatment in the army and didn't wish to enlist. Well, the 1853 law wasn't actually repealed until 1864, and the rest of the Black Codes remained in force until February of 1865. So, nonetheless, despite the Black Codes, there were, at the beginning of the war, roughly 7,628 black Illinois citizens. Plus, there were thousands of escaped slaves from Kentucky and Missouri, especially in 1861 and, uh, and 1862 that had begun to leave when the army started to come through. A very large proportion of the 29th enlisted men would come from this group of illegal uh, entrants into Illinois. Third, the thing that discouraged them a little bit, and you may again remember the scene in, in glory, is that the Confederates had put a thing out saying that captured blacks would be either summarily executed or sold back into slavery while white officers of black troops would be charged with inciting insurrection. As you can imagine, this was a deterrent for many. Well, Governor Yates selected Captain John Armstrong Bross of the 88th Illinois to be the new commander of the regiment. He was charged with starting to recruit and get people there. Now, Bross was actually born in Milford, Pennsylvania, and had been a lawyer and assistant US Marshal in Chicago. He had raised two companies for the 88th Illinois and had a good combat record with the 88th as the uh, captain of Company A, they fought in the Army of the Cumberland. He was a Douglas Democrat, but his brother was a Republican and co-owner of the Chicago Tribune. So the two of them were well known in Illinois and influential. We'll go back to a picture of some of the men. It took all that winter, but Company A was finally filled up and sworn into federal service on April 24th, 1864. Now, we don't have a lot of personal details about these men. As I say, few were born in Illinois. Most were escaped slaves, mostly from Missouri and Kentucky. For example, almost every original enlistee in Company A was living in Missouri just prior to enlistment. Now, the assembly point was Quincy, which I showed you a few minutes ago, and uh, this is where the first recruits were signed up. 
and eventually they got all six companies. Company F was credited to Wisconsin, not because the soldiers were from there, but in fact, most of them were recruited in Illinois and Missouri, but because Wisconsin agents out-recruited the Illinois guys, and they offered better bounties. So maybe they were smarter up here, I don't know. As I said earlier, the regiment was extremely short-staffed after officers. Some of the companies, such as Company F, only had 22 men as of late April 1862 when the regiment left for the East, and it didn't merit a full amount of uh, officers. The chief problem in getting officers, however, was not so much the number of people in the regiment. It was the completely different rules in which blacks were, uh, rather whites were recruited for being officers in black regiments. Now in white regiments, the governor of a state had their power to appoint officers. Not so in black ones. In black ones, officers had to be appointed by the federal government and they had to first be examined by Major General Silas Casey's boards of examination, who brought these people forward and tested them on various things. Do they know tactics? Do they know this, that, and the other thing? So when the, when the 29th left for Virginia theater of war, it was very shorthanded, some of its officers not having even been mustered. Training was also a major issue. First, there were very few officers to do it. Second, none of the black soldiers from whom the non-coms were drawn had any army experience whatsoever. Third, most of the officers had no experience at the level that they were being officers at. So new officers and new men had to learn on the job. Moreover, most officers began to realize that they had to sort of socialize, if you will, blacks into a white culture of military culture, which was determined by what whites had done in order to make them understand things like uh, educational issues, sanitary issues, social issues, how they responded to officers and how they respond to each other. So being a slave or an escaped slave doesn't prepare you for this kind of socialization particularly. So they spent a lot of time trying to do this thing, even just teaching them how to read or write. While at Quincy, the regiment did some basic training, marching and evolutions, but they were not issued weapons and had no training in how to make war. Nonetheless, Grant needed every man for his overland campaign and the regiment, except the still short Company F, was mustered into federal service on April 25th, 1864, which marks the official beginning of the regiment. Essentially untrained, and undermanned, there were roughly 450 enlisted men and about 12 officers, most still waiting for their commissions and thus on mustard when the regiment entrained for at Quincy for the journey to Washington, D.C. They reached Washington on May 1st and immediately were assigned to the 4th Division of the 9th Corps. So the 4th Division was Edward Ferraro was the Brigadier General in charge of the 4th Division, which was an entirely black division. And uh, Burnside, whom I'm sure you're all familiar with, was the uh, commander of the 9th Corps. The 29th was entirely unprepared to go into the field, so it was kept at Camp Casey outside of Washington in Virginia to prepare new recruits and train. Burnside's Ninth Corps, meanwhile, was stationed at Manassas Junction, and Ferraro had only nine of his promised nine regiments for his division. The rest were en route, or like the 29th, were not ready yet. Now this is the flag of the 28th USCI, which actually joined the 29th at Camp Casey and was part of their brigade. Um, I imagine that the original flags of the 29th probably looked like this, very straightforward US uh, regimentals. <coughs> Um, the 28th hailed from Indiana and was as equally trained as the 29th. So obviously they needed to train for a whole month. During this time, uh, Company F got recruited up to strength and at the end of May, the 29th, ready or not, was ordered to join uh, the uh, Ferraro's command which was in the field. They arrived at White House Landing at June, on June 3rd and were immediately put to building fortifications. On June, on June 9th, however, they uh, finally joined Ferraro at Old Church Tavern on the Pamunkey River. While Grant's army crossed the James in an attempt to flank Lee at Petersburg, the 4th Division performed rear guard duties. When Ferraro had joined Grant initially, his five very understrength regiments were tasked with guarding the Army of Potomac's wagon trains. 
they thought that would be safe for them, but they didn't reckon on Confederate cavalry attacking the wagons train. So they, some of them got their first taste of combat, holding off, and, and quite credibly so, the Confederate cavalry trying to burn those trains. When the 29th joined, uh, their fellows, they continued in those duties and duly arrived on the north bank of the James themselves on June 16th. They were now part of the 4th Division's 2nd Brigade, which was commanded by Colonel Henry Goddard Thomas of the 19th USCI. Now Thomas is an interesting guy because he was a regular army officer and the first regular army officer to accept a colored command. Um, his brigade consisted of the 19th, the 23rd, the 28th, the 29th, and the 31st USCI. The 1st Brigade, under Colonel Joshua K. Siegfried, who was Colonel of the 48th Pennsylvania, which will figure in our story rather prominently, um, was the, uh, actually put in charge of that 1st Brigade, um, which consisted of the 27th, the 30th, the 39th, and the 43rd USCI. Well, they all crossed that big pontoon bridge over the James on the 17th, and they finally rejoined the 9th Corps, which has three white divisions in addition to the 4th Division, which is black, from whom the black division had been detached on June 19th. And then Meade immediately detached them again and had them uh, chasing around, moving around federal lines, sort of filling gaps wherever white troops were involved in fighting. They would fill in the trenches and sort of guard them, and then they would move them somewhere else. It wasn't until July 22nd that they, that they rejoined Burnside's 9th Corps. And they weren't actually given a section of trench. They were just kind of held in reserve. So small parts of the division would be put in here and this place or over here and that place uh, amongst the white units. Now it's interesting, the three white divisions of the 9th Corps took a severe beating during this month. And the reason was partially because um, while other white regiments of other corps very often fraternized in the quiet periods in from the trenches with the, with the Johnnies. The Ninth Corps was known by the Rebs as the, I'll just use the N-word corps, and um, they kept a harassing fire in them at all times and wouldn't fraternize and wouldn't have any peace. They were just constantly lobbing shells and, and, and shooting at them. So they took relatively heavy casualties. Um, 12 officers and 230 men 30, 231 men were killed and 44 officers and 851 men wounded for 1150 total before the end of July without fighting a major engagement. As a result, the morale of the white troops of the 9th Corps was rather poor, which factored into the disaster of the crater. Ironically, the black division, being constantly moved in and out uh, and all around the defensive trenches, suffered very few casualties. At the end of July, the 4th Division had over 4,000 men and its morale was actually quite high, unlike their white counterparts. So this, plus the fact that the 9th Corps happened to be manning the position where the crater attack was to happen, helped settle the task on the Black 4th. So here we have an overview, kind of, of, of an artist's conception of what the crater looked like after the explosion. Um, I think you're mostly probably pretty reasonably familiar with how this all came about. When Grant crossed the James in late June, a couple of his corps commanders failed to act as they should have, and therefore Petersburg was, was regained uh, by the Confederates, and they, re they put up defensive lines, which uh, they should have really been taken, but they didn't take it. So failing to act decisively, Grant now had stalled around that city, and there seemed to be no solution to the deadlock. And the North, of course, had grown restless over the severe casualties of the Overland campaign and the apparent lack of results. Never mind that Lee was now trapped in the Richmond-Petersburg defenses. That didn't dawn on the newspapers in the North as being particularly significant. The popular mind, not to mention Lincoln and Staten and Washington, were anxious for more gaudy results. And politically, of course, there's a, there's a presidential election looming. So this becomes important as well. So, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Pleasance, now commanding the 48th Pennsylvania, because his colonel is commanding the 1st Brigade of the, of, the second, of the 4th Division, proposed digging a mine under the southern fortifications in late June, and Grant took note and then approved it. Ironically, as I said, Colonel Siegfried of the 48th is now commanding one of the brigades that's going to go into this, into this uh, crater. 
So this is a map then of what the crater looks like. There's a tunnel entrance and they dug all the way underneath the lines of the Confederates and basically were uh, planned to create um, a bomb, a huge bomb. So now the 48th Pennsylvania was made up of uh, coal miners from around Scranton and that whole area. Okay, and Pleasants, who was now in command, knew that his men could dig a mine, even though this was a very long uh, tunnel for this. Uh, curiously enough, one of my wife's ancestors, William Kohler, was a, actually a member of the 48th Pennsylvania. He was, in fact, in the coal farm, the coal mining region up there. But he had been wounded and captured in the wilderness, so he wasn't part of this operation. Um, here's a side view of what they were actually trying to do, as you can see. It's a very long tunnel, and they had problems figuring out oxygen, you know, and, you know that's this kind of thing. As the mine was being dug, Burnside was asked to select troops to lead the assault. And Grant had seen such assaults fail at Vicksburg and wanted to make sure that the men chosen would be prepared for their task of breaking through. Burnside had not been thrilled with the idea of the mine at all. But, you know, it was, that was the decision, it was going to happen, and so he had to go along with it and do something and choose the troops. So he had to choose his spearhead. Who's going to be his spearhead? And he chose the 4th Division. He says, these are the guys who have the good morale. These are the guys that haven't suffered the casualties. Okay, they're on trained, yeah, but we'll, we'll work on that for a week or so and see what we can do. So they weren't really chosen for their combat experience, because they didn't have any, um, but for their numbers and their morale. Compared to his white divisions, Burnside figures that his black one would do just fine, especially since if all went well, a breakthrough should happen easily and white troops would then rapidly back up the black troops, or so he thought. Meanwhile, in July, in between other assignments, the black troops are run through their paces as to what they were supposed to do, although they were not told the actual mission until just a few days before the mine was to be exploded. The men apparently knew that they were training for some sort of assault, and they were very proud of it. Colonel Thomas later wrote, both officers and men were eager to show the white troops what the colored division could do. We had acquired confidence in our men. They believed us infallible. They were told of their mission just a few days before the planned assault. Thomas reported that the men gathered in small groups, talking, and then one soldier began to sing, we looks like men a marching on. We looks like men are war, and it broke out amongst all the ranks. As I said, Burnside felt that his black division was the best suited to carry out this and was confident of success as the veteran divisions of the 9th would be in close support. His plan was actually pretty simple. After the explosion, the two black brigades would move in column to the rebel line and, and would then move left and right to start pulling up the flanks of the areas that weren't yet blown up and pushing the stunned Confederates back. The rest of the blacks would then, the rest of the black troops would then move towards Cemetery Hill, which was high ground behind um, the entrenchments, and uh, take it. The white divisions would then quickly push through, securing the breach. No one, he specified, should enter the crater because there was no point to that. If all went well, Burnside wrote Meade, the Corps won't even be able to break through into Petersburg itself. Meade and Grant tried to increase the chances of success by having the 5th and the 28th Corps, excuse me, the 18th Corps, sorry, support the 9th Corps while the 2nd would support the right flank. Other units, even as on the other side of the James, were to press the defenses of the Confederates in order to prevent Lee from sending reinforcements from other, other parts of the line. That was the idea. The mine was dug, the underground tunnels were cleared, and 8,000 pounds of powder laid into the two galleries by July 29th. The attack was now set for early July 30th. And then the plan came apart. On June 28th, General George Meade had met with Burnside and had objected to Burnside's use of the Black Division. He also objected to the right and left wheeling uh, motions as unnecessary, for the force of the attack must be straight ahead through the breach and up to the hill behind. For our purposes, the key point is his objection to using black troops for the spearhead, for he expected there to be heavy casualties in the first division in. 
they would be taking the brunt of the defense's response while giving time for the supporting units to move in. He looked at it as a, as a forlorn hope, that there was going to be, you know, this was more of a suicide mission for the front people. They were going to try to clear out the Confederates. They would take the fire, and then the other units would come in and secure it. He told Burnside that the black troops were too untried, and he needed to put in his best people. Burnside said, these are my best people. <laughs> He said, these are the people we've, we've been working with. He says his, his white divisions were um, not capable of this. They'd been under fire for 40 days, and they were tired, and they were gun-shy. Well, you have to understand the history between Meade and Burnside. Uh, they didn't like each other. Meade thought Burnside was not a very good soldier. Remember that after Fredericksburg and Meade not being supported, you know, and Burnside was in charge of the Army at that time, um, this created a lot of friction. And, uh, and, and, of course, Burnside didn't like sort of serving under Meade because he was senior to Meade. So these were a lot of issues. Um, but, you know, he said, okay, look, uh, rather than fight with him right there, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll put it to Grant. Let's see what Grant has to say. Well, then Burnside went back, and he didn't hear anything, you know, for a day. So he, he goes on. He says, well, I have to continue with my plan. So he's actually in a meeting with two of his other division commanders, Orlando Bolivar Wilcox and Robert Potter. When about 11 a.m. on July 29th, Meade rides up and says, you know what, Grant's nixed this whole thing with the black division. Use your white guys. And with the presidential election looming, Grant had made a political decision. Later testifying to Congress, Grant said, General Burnside wanted to put in his colored division in front. And I believe if he had done so, it would have been a success. Still, I agree with General Meade and his objection to that plan. General, uh, General Meade said that if we put the colored troops in front, and we only had that one division there, it would, and it, would, it should prove a failure, it would then be said, and very properly, that we were shoving these people ahead to get killed because we did not care anything about them. But that could not be said if we put the white troops in front. With this fait accompli, Burnside now had a whole afternoon in order to modify his plan. He discussed this problem with his three white division commanders. And for three hours, they could not come up with a solution. Nobody wanted to lead the spearhead. You know, they all had objections as to why their division or their, you know, couldn't be the right one, so forth and so on. They all agreed that Ferraro's Division Four should lead, but Grant had flattered, flatly said, no, that's not going to happen. So accordingly, and with no enthusiasm, Burnside did what Burnside did so well. He booted his responsibility as Corps Commander and literally had his three white division commanders draw straws to decide which division would be in front. It fell to the absolute worst. First Division Brigadier General James Ledley, who was a drunk and a coward, to lead this assault. Why this man was still in command of a division is beyond my comprehension, having read about his previous um, you know, escapades. His men didn't trust him. They knew he was a drunk. He didn't get out in front. Well, needless to say, the assault was going to go as well as you can imagine. Burnside directed Ledley to avoid the crater and push onto the hill behind the lines. The second division and the third division were to go to the left and right flanks to protect the first and extend the breach. The fourth division was now relegated to go in immediately behind the others, following Ledley's path. The white troops were entirely unready and wholly unmotivated to make this charge. This was a major factor in dooming the effort. The black division was more than ready to make the assault, but they nonetheless were under strength, as I have already mentioned. Okay, I'm going to run out of time here. I'm sorry, I'm going to try to go through this a little faster, but I'm, I'm, it, it's, yeah, there's a lot, I always overwrite things. <laughs> so it's the historian in me, I guess. Okay, well, we, we know that the, the returns are incomplete for the 29th U.S. in, uh, U.S. colored in, in uh, July. But we know that with the six companies, they should have had about 480 enlisted men, but they probably only had a half to maybe two-thirds of that when you count people that were sick or injured or otherwise not available for duty. Um, the regimental headquarters is made up of Colonel Bross, Major T. Jefferson Brown, and two surgeons. That was it. The company officers had to be detailed to do regimental and duties as well as company duties, and they didn't have any other staff. So, 
Ross had, in addition to Major Brown, only 11 company-grade officers, plus four others who were not yet mustered, but volunteered to participate nonetheless, even though they weren't even mustered into the Army yet. That evening, the troops moved into position. The black troops were not informed of the change of plans until quite late. Colonel Thomas says he was not informed until 11 p.m. in the evening, and the assault was supposed to go off the next morning. The troops were awakened at 3 a.m. The white divisions and those assigned from other corps that were supposed to take their, took their places. Um, everybody was notified late. They stumbled around in the dark. They couldn't find out where they were supposed to go. It was a sleepless and bewildering night for the white troops of the 9th Corps. The mine was supposed to go off at 3.30 in the morning, but there was nothing but silence. The fuse had been faulty, and uh, some of the, there was one brave guy that went in there and found that the fuse was dead and then reattached it and then restarted it again. Once, the, once it blew up, there were 110 Union guns and 54 mortars who opened fire on the Confederate positions. Here's a map of the attack, one of these uh, sort of um, park, 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 you know, uh, National Park Service maps. So you can see where the attack is going across. You can see where the crater is. You can see the, the black troops here in a nice column uh, heading in after the white troops already had gone in. The mine had blown a crater 200 feet long, 80 feet wide, and 25 deep. And if you go now, it looks very unimpressive. But if you it can imagine it at the time, it was much more impressive. Ledley ordered two of his brigade, brigade commanders to move out. But he neglected to tell them what their objective was. So they didn't know that the high ground was where they were supposed to go. So they moved into the crater. And then he promptly retired to a bomb proof in the rear with a supply of liquor. He was not seen again that morning at the front. His two brigades immediately lost their formation as they kind of walked forward without any much direction. The Union troops were a little stunned by the blast as well because this thing was quite unbelievable when it blew up. And they headed right for the crater, exactly where they should not have gone. The two courageous brigade commanders didn't have any orders as to their objective and Ledley was not there to tell them, so they didn't know what to do. So they ended up coming into the crater like this and the charge towards Cemetery Hill was never made by the white troops and the crater just filled up with men. And when the Confederates recovered their wits, um, a half an hour later, they started to attack those in the pit. Some of the Federals fought courageously, but it was, as one observer called it, a confused mob. Units were all mixed up and nobody was obviously in command. And again, Ledley was not there to reorganize his division. He was back drinking in the bomb proof and had been joined by General Ferraro. Meanwhile, the black troops watched, listened, and waited. And they had been arranged in four breast columns from 4 a.m. and waited in the covered trenches that connected the rear of the railway embankment with the forward positions. Well, about 6 a.m. with the attack failing and all three white divisions engaged, Meade frantically orders Burnside to throw in everybody in reserve, including the fourth. So now Burnside sends an order to Ferraro, who's with Ledley in the bomb proof. And Ferraro says, but, you know, we can't move forward. We're blocked by the white troops, which was pretty much true. Um, a second order was sent. Ferraro again declined to obey it. Finally, at 7.30, a third order was presented to Ferraro to move his division into the crater and up the hill. As he prepared to do so, William W. Loring, who was Burnside's assistant inspector general, had, who had just been in the crater, came back and said, no, 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 General Burnside doesn't understand the situation. You can't move into this. It'll be a disaster. And counter-ruled it, counter-overruled over, it. And then he said, the order struck me as being so unfortunate that I took the liberty to countermand it on the spot, he testified later. But then reporting to Burnside, he was overruled. So he had to go back and say, sorry, got to send them in. So that's what they did. And no matter how inappropriate, they sent them in. So now you can see a little more closely in the detail of the troops moving forward towards the, directly towards the crater. It wasn't until 8 a.m. in the morning that the black troops finally were able to join the battle. They had been blocked by wounded and by POWs and by the other troops, and watching all these wounded didn't exactly improve their, their morale. When they finally did step forward, many observers said it was in fine style. The 1st Brigade was followed closely by the 2nd, and the 4th Division advanced across the field under a storm of rifle and artillery fire coming from three sides. 
The Pennsylvania sergeant who had repaired the mine fuse observed the charge and commented, it made me frantic to see the useless destruction. And when the assault had failed, it made me still more furious to see a division of colored soldiers rush into the jaws of death with no prospect of success. But they went in cheering as though they didn't mind it, and a great many of them never came back. The second brigade was followed, uh, was led, excuse me, by the 31st, followed by the 19th, 23rd, 28th, and the 29th was in the rear. This brigade tried to follow their original orders and headed toward Cemetery Hill. A first brigade observer later wrote, we saw the second brigade going in fine shape over the line of the first division over the bomb proof out into the open field on our left and their front. Instantly the batteries on Cemetery Hill and Wright's battery turned on them and a sharp infantry fire reached them from the ravine in their front. We could see great gaps made in their lines as grape tore its way through. They reached a covered way that ran diagonally across the ravine and stayed there. A Confederate officer later wrote, to the credit of the blacks, it, 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 it be it, excuse me, to the credit of the blacks, be it said that they advanced in better order and pushed farther, forward farther than the whites. Ferraro later testified that the troops went in in the most gallant manner, that they went in without hesitation, moved right straight ahead forward, passed through the crater that was filled with troops, and all but one regiment of my division passed beyond the crater. But in the, in the face of intense fire and horrific casualties, they faltered. General, Colonel Thomas ordered his brigade to scatter and fall back on the 1st Brigade's positions, forward in the, which was forward of the crater, but in the rear, in a sense. Um, and uh, so they, they, they came back down the hill, which they weren't able to take. And the 1st Brigade was holding rifle pits, where they had captured 200 Rebs earlier in the fight and had recaptured a stand of colors belonging to one of the 9th Corps' White's regiments. Captain Hector Aiken of Company B was mortally wounded, and, Captain, and Colonel, uh, excuse me, Ca Company E's Captain William E. F H. Flint was killed in this first attack. Thomas had tried to take the hill in front, but enfilade fire drove them back. That means fire coming from the sides as well as the front. Loring had feared that putting the 4th Division into the chaos would have just made the situation much worse, and that's exactly what happened. Siegfried and Thomas tried to bull their way through, but all but one of their regiments made it beyond the crater, but couldn't get any further. They were caught in those Confederate rifle pits and couldn't get out. Hundreds were struck down. Meanwhile, Ferraro, safe somewhere in the rear, forwarded an order to Thomas from Burnside directing that his brigade charge and immediately proceed to take that crest in your front, meaning the Cemetery Hill. Thomas gamely tried to obey. So at about 9.15 a.m., he gathered the disorganized remnants of the 23rd, 28th, and 29th regiments to do just that. He sent to Colonel Siegfried, who was on his right, that I was about to charge and we should go over with a yell and that I hoped to be supported. Bross and the 29th were in the lead. Details now get rather sketchy, but the intensity of the fight can be told by the fate of the color bearers. Two were killed, two severely wounded. Then Captain James W. Brockway seized the colors and was so severely injured in the foot that he lost it and was amputated later. Finally, Bross himself took the colors and jumped on the parapet. Calling on his men to charge, he was shot down and killed. The colors never recovered. There was no report of their capture either, so it's not clear what happened to the colors. Maybe somebody took them home. Thomas's men charged but ran right into a furious counterattack by Colonel David A. Weisinger's Virginia Brigade of William Mahone's division. They had seen an officer with a flag rise up from the Federal line. This was certainly John Bross. The Federals appeared to be coming, so Mahone ordered Weisinger in. Their charge shattered the 2nd Brigade. Thomas wrote that his command was, after a struggle, driven back over the rifle pits. At this moment, a panic commenced. The black and white troops came pouring back together. The three broken black regiments carried with them white soldiers from other divisions, and they all piled into the crater, which seemed to them to offer protection. These untrained black troops did what they could without support and finally broke. The battle now developed into what is called the stampede. The Ninth Corps simply fell apart. Some ran to Union lines, others ran into the crater, some more offered themselves as prisoners to the Southerners. Most of Thomas's brigade, except for 200 who retreated into the pit, joined the 19th, which was already, joining the 19th colored, which was already there, ran all the way back to Union lines. There they were reformed, but played no more, 
in the, and played no more part in the events of the day. At this point, General Grant arrives just as the fourth, as, as the ninth, excuse me, the Ninth Corps breaks and ordered Meade to end this disaster. So Meade sent an order to Burnside to get his men out, but Burnside protested and delayed until afternoon. It's not until 1220 did he send his divisional commanders orders to withdraw as best they could. Unfortunately, not one of the four was with his troops. But they kindly sent word up to the brigade commanders uh, to, to figure it out for themselves. Meanwhile, the men in the crater tried to defend themselves as best they could. Now it gets kind of dicey. So um, not only did the black soldiers have to fear being murdered by the southerners, apparently they were reports of white federals bayoneting them or shooting them because they were afraid that the white southerners would then charge them with fighting with black troops and it would be severe on them if they got captured. So, um, and the longer they all stayed in the crater, the more Confederates arrived to attack them. Within the crater, an officer observed, the white troops were now exhausted and discouraged. Leaving the line, they sat down facing inwards and neither threats nor entreaties could get them up into the line again. From this time on, the fire was kept up mainly by the colored troops and officers handling muskets. Finally, Brigadier General William F. Bartlett, the senior officer left in the crater, had seen enough. He ordered a general retreat. This caused uh, people to basically every man for himself. Um, as the rebels entered the crater, they bayoneted wounded blacks. This caused other black soldiers to resist to the death rather than surrender. But even when the blue coats stopped fighting, the killing of black soldiers continued. One Alabama brigade officer wrote, this slaughter would not have been so great had our men not found Negro soldiers in the fort with the whites. This was the first time we had met Negro troops and the men were enraged at them for being there and at the whites for having them there. Worse, black troops who had been captured were summarily executed. There's numerous reports, not only by captured whites of the atrocities by Southerners, but by the Confederates themselves in letters, etc., who were by no means ashamed of having done this. In fact, as attested to by Southern newspapers, the Confederates blamed Grant and the black soldiers for bringing the slaughter on themselves. The Ninth Corps suffered severe casualties, but records are extremely incomplete. Uh, Miller, in his book on the 29th, says the Ninth Corps lost 3,828 officers and men killed, wounded, and missing. About 20% of those engaged. But the Fourth Division's casualties represented 35% of that number. When counts were made after the war, accounting for captured and died in rebel hands, the black regiments lost uh, 209 killed, nine, 697 wounded, and 421 missing, probably mostly killed. Some have estimated twice as high account for the fourth. The 29th casualties are hard to pinpoint because there were a lack of reports. Nearly every officer had been injured. Three were killed. All the survivors were granted leave while the four unmustered lieutenants who were not actually injured went home to wait until they got mustered in it. The 29th was literally left without an officer and Colonel Thomas had to ask Ferraro for some loans from other regiments. So uh, Miller, looking at the records, determined that the 29th lost uh, 38 men killed or died of wounds, 32 prisoners, 18 of which died in rebel hands, and something close to 75 wounded, which is the best that can be discovered based on the poor records. All in all, the 29th lost about 28% of its strength. Well, of course, the disaster, everybody's pointing fingers, and um, they had a couple of uh, investigations about this. Um, a court of inquiry blamed Ledley and Ferraro, but Ferraro was simply, rather than being dismissed, not excuse me, not Ferraro, Ledley, instead of being dismissed from the army, was sent on never-ending leave, so he never commanded again, and, uh, and then Ferraro was actually promoted to brevet major general in December and continued to man the 4th Division. The testimony of officers during the investigations, and there were actually two, generally commended the conduct of the black troops. As for the black troops themselves, well, we have very few accounts, but those we have emphasize how important it was to fight and show themselves brave and willing to die for the benefit of their race. They would do what was necessary to elevate ourselves and our race. Although in service until November 1865, having been sent to the border in Texas with all the black 25th Corps, the crater would be the only major battle 
in which the 29th fought. And here we have a celebration of the anniversary of the crater and there's a, a black reenactment unit uh, to do that at the actual place where it happened in, in Petersburg. And with that hurried end, I am finished. <laughs> so um, I hope that wasn't more information than you could deal with. Um, well, thank you all very much. You know, thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you.